Good morning. As always, it's my pleasure and privilege to open up God's Word with you today. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 14 as we continue our reflections on this 14th and 15th chapter in Mark during this Holy Week. And if, you, if you've been with us these past few days, you may have realized that we're walking with Jesus through this week. And as we're walking with Jesus, it doesn't take long to realize that we're walking to a very specific destination. We're walking with him to the cross. Two days ago, if you were with us with Pastor Jay, he shared the story of Mary anointing Jesus. And he, Jesus himself said this was for a purpose. It was for his burial, speaking of his impending death. And yesterday with Pastor Tyler, he shared about how Jesus passed out the bread and the wine as his broken body and his shed blood, again speaking of his impending death. And we know if we've read the gospel accounts that this is not the first time Jesus has told his disciples that he's going to die. In fact, if we've read Mark's gospel up to this point, Already to this point in the 14th chapter, three different times, he's made very specific, explicit, direct predictions that the Son of Man must be killed. And each time, it went right over the disciples' head. They didn't understand. They were confused, if anything. But Jesus was not confused. He knew exactly what lied ahead. He knew exactly why the Father sent him. And he knew exactly what he had to do. You see, from his earliest days, Jesus was about his father's business. What does he say when he's 12 years old and his parents lose him, end up finding him at the temple? What does he say? He says, why were you searching for me? In other words, you should have known where I would be, Mom in my father's house, about my father's business. Fast forward 20 years later, Jesus' mindset had not changed. He was determined to do his father's will, even as the cross drew near. In Luke's gospel, it says that as the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. All his life had been a path to the cross. And now when the time had come, he knew it was near. He doubled down and stayed the course. But in today's text, we're going to see that Jesus doing so to be obedient to the Father even to the cross. It was not easy for him. The anticipation, just the mere anticipation of his suffering was suffering in and of itself. All throughout Jesus' life, he faced temptation to avoid the cross, but none as severe as in the garden in Gethsemane. Read with me in chapter 14 here, verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Do you picture the scene here? Jesus, alone, 
falling on the ground and praying, crying out. Very sorrowful, even to death, he says. We don't see it here, but in Luke's account, we get more detail that Jesus was so distraught that he was sweating. His sweat was like drops of blood that fell on the ground. Just a stone's throw away, his closest companions. Not only did they not understand the gravity of what was going on, but they were falling asleep. There was no comfort for Jesus there. But Jesus was not completely alone. In Luke's account, again, we don't see it here, but Luke's account tells us that an angel appeared to Jesus to strengthen him. No doubt sent from the Father. And so Jesus cries out to the Father, not once, not twice, but three times. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Remove this cup from me. What is this cup that Jesus prays about here? What is this cup that Jesus was to drink? Well, you could argue it was the incredible physical suffering that Jesus would endure. The flogging. The spikes through his hands. The asphyxiation of the cross. You might also argue it was the incredible emotional suffering that he would endure. He was just minutes away from betrayal from one of his disciples, desertion from all his closest friends, and all the mockery of the cross, Peter himself denying him three times. But as horrible as all those things were for Jesus, and they were horrible, The reality is that this cup that he prays about here was far worse, far worse. You see, God's wrath for sin must be satisfied. This cup was God's wrath. The cup was the spiritual agony that Jesus would bear for bearing the sins of the world. God would not sin let would not let sin go unpunished. So Paul says that God made him to be sin who knew no sin. The sinless one, Jesus, became sin so that us, the ones who know sin well, that we might become the righteousness of God. The cup Jesus was to drink was a cup of God's fury. On the cross, God's wrath would be poured out in all its fullness. And Jesus knew this well. And so here he was, lying on the ground, sweating blood, crying out to the Father, Abba, Father, remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Today, we sit in the garden with Jesus on the doorstep of him drinking this unimaginable cup. He is in agony, sorrowful even to death, he says. Well, we know and he knew death was coming. Yet he determined, as he did when he was 12 years old, to do the Father's will. Not what I will, but what you will. He was about his father's business all the way to the cross. This book tells the story about God's business from beginning to end. It's a a grand story of redemption and victory where all the glory belongs to God. But lest we forget that that victory came at a great cost a cost that only Jesus could pay. So here in the garden, we are reminded that even the anticipation of the cross was suffering in and of itself. And if just the anticipation was this difficult and this agonizing, 
how much more would there be anguish on the cross? In the garden, we remember the great cost of the cross, the cup before him, and how thankful we should be that he drank it. He drank it for you and for me. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow.